So the president will be here very soon, I hope. Um, he's probably running a little bit late. But on his behalf, and Dean Lucchese, and uh, distinguished guests and family members, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, retirement tribute in honor of our beloved Eli A. Friedman. A picture says a thousand words. So we're going to go with pictures and videos to illustrate the point so that we don't have to talk too much. So we're going to start the session with a video interview uh, of Eli A. Friedman. When I first began clinical treatment of sick patients, it was a rare event to be able to do anything positive to alter the course of the patient's illness and the path to death if they had kidney failure. But as I learned that there were people working on trying to keep life going when it was threatened by a failure of the kidneys to function, I was um, attracted to this potential substitution for a failing vital organ and wanted to see whether there was something I might be able to do. I then met key people in the field who were part of my medical residency and then fellowship at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. And the people I met were engaged in building what was called an artificial kidney, a way of treating the sick patient with kidney failure to remove the accumulated chemicals that were intoxicating and would kill the patient by a process that was called hemo blood dialysis. Hemodialysis was performed initially a couple of times, two and then later three times a week to keep a sick patient with absent or very minimal kidney function alive. And as this was done, the specialist, the man who invented the dialysis procedure, Willem Kulf, in uh, the West Coast, then it was uh, aided by other pioneer investigators who built and serviced artificial kidneys, building Scribner in Seattle, Washington being one of them, to see whether we could actually keep patients alive for more than an initial treatment, but on a chronic basis. And when we had a recurring treatment and it was settling down to be done two or three times a week and the patients kept alive and they could have a, a family and they could travel and they could do other things, it was pretty exciting and that's what hooked me into dialysis as a profession. The first point to make clear is that the dialysis procedure, which generally takes from a couple of hours to maybe four or more hours, depending on the patient and the severity of illness, was something that is complex and was difficult to do without a dialysis machine, a device that was the way that the blood of the patient was cycled by a motor under electrical energy to run through a membrane sac, sac made up of cellophane or like cellophane-like material that was transparent, a membrane, and the patient who had their blood treated going through this membrane in a solution of dialysate, a liquid that washed the waste products out of the blood and kept the good things, the red, cell, red blood cells and the other things intact. And the patient who had a dialysis and had it for several hours and then was able to have this multiple times a week, was able to go to work, was able to go to school, to teach, to be a business person. And the problem of the fatalness of kidney failure was mainly solved by a introduction of a chronic therapy. 
But the chronic therapy was cumbersome and difficult and needed staff workers and needed a way of being introduced for a lot of patients. So dialysis units were formed and they treated patients at the same time on a number of shifts and the treatment of kidney failure by dialysis became an American accomplishment that was picked up for the rest of the world. We were able to have dialysis treatments performed in the home. We were able to have dialysis units. And the place where I went after completing my work at Harvard was the Downstate Medical Center affiliated with Kings County Hospital. And Kings County Hospital across the street from the medical school devoted a ward, a full ward, A22, that was used for treatment of kidney patients. And when this worked and the patients were alive and were able to come back and forth for two or three treatments a week, we had a new therapy so that dialysis changed the inevitability of near-term death. And that was exciting. The realization that once a patient left near proximity of the hospital that was giving them dialysis, they would die if they didn't come back on the frequency twice a week or three times a week that the unit ordered for them. And so portable dialysis would allow them not only to treat themselves at home periodically or on a trip if they had to make an important political or business trip, and it meant that the severity of the dialysis murdering them uh, the severity of the dialysis preventing their being murdered by the poisoning of kidney failure products that were accumulating because the kidney didn't work was something that I became enchanted with and wanted to use to have more patients, more people respond to the availability of dialysis and live a new life that was otherwise unavailable. There was a need for new patients who were going to have dialysis to learn what dialysis was and what they ought to do. And the staff that would be used to teach them and train them and answer all their questions would not during that period be able to deliver the therapy of dialysis, which is what they were trained to do. So having a staff of people who could handle new patients and worry about how they would eat and what they would travel and where they would travel was something that needed to be arranged, and that's what we tried to do with the American Association of Kidney Patients, the AAKP, which to this date has been a remarkably important and beneficial assistance to the growth of kidney failure therapy. I believe we will have cheaper dialysis, less expensive, I believe that we will have more patients who are regularly dialyzed and working at top level components. I could easily envision a United States Senator or representative of, in Washington being on dialysis and functioning fully. And the more people are, that are seen handling dialysis and adding it to their life, the more that we will use this to treat everybody with kidney failure who could be salvaged and kept alive. The other thing is that kidney transplants have improved and are continuing to improve. That means taking a kidney from someone who is donating it. You can live with one kidney and you're born with two. So that means a family member, a parent, a brother or sister can give you a kidney and more and more people can get off dialysis because they have a functioning transplant. There are also studies in progress now to use animal kidneys in humans, whether they will work and I think they will, and provide dialysis without the need for a kidney donor who is human, I believe it's an exciting adventure and I'm very much th thrilled to have been part of it. And I've been fortunate that Kolf and Scribner and Merrill were right and that their predictions are absolutely coming true and that we will have a growing number of patients on dialysis and as we make the dialysis machines less expensive, as we make the procedure less cumbersome, that there'll be more people functioning in the United States on dialysis. 
And I also think it will be possible biochemically when the smart chemists work with us a little more thoroughly to change the waste products that accumulate in kidney failure so that people with kidney failure may not even need dialysis more than once a month. That's a prediction that I can't support with numbers, but it's a hope that I have. Dr. Friedman, on behalf of our president, our dean, our campus, our Department of Medicine, the Renal Division, I would like to say thank you for all these years of service. You spent almost all your life in Darmstadt. You've done wonderful things for everyone. You've raised the academic bar for everyone, including myself. The way you touched people is incredible. So we're all here today to say thank you for all that you've done to humanity, all the contribution that you've done to Downstate. And I'm sure that we would carry on that legacy to make sure that student education and house education remains intact in the way you cherished them. So thank you. Thank you. And now our president needs no introduction. He would make some remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, what a great uh, occasion uh, to recognize uh, one of Downstate Medical Center's greatest teachers and clinicians. In March uh, 1995, I was a then second year resident on the renal service at the Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. And it was on rounds that morning when the chief of nephrology, Dr. Wadi Suki, started uh, quizzing me about trans, uh, dialysis. And I was kind of flat-footed, and uh, needless to say, I fumbled through some answers. And uh, later that day, uh, his secretary called me and said, Dr. S Dr. Suki has an article he wants you to read. And I went by his office, and I picked up the article, and I opened up the envelope. And it was an article written by a distinguished professor here at Downstate, and that's Dr. Eli Friedman. And I didn't know Dr. Friedman, but after that day, and after reading that article, I knew about his amazing contributions uh, to dialysis and to the care of kidney patients all over the world. So that was my first introduction to Eli Friedman uh, on the Methodist uh, renal service. And little did I know, as fate would have it, some years later, Dr. Friedman, I would be here uh, as one of your colleagues and uh, here as president of the great State University Health Science Center, Brooklyn Downstate Medical Center, uh, to uh, congratulate you, to applaud you, uh, to give you the embrace of this entire academic community, this Department of Medicine, this section of nephrology for what you have meant uh, to us at Downstate and more importantly, to the lives you have touched and the lives that you have continued uh, by your work. Uh, Professor Friedman, it has been an honor for all of us to have worked with you and to know you, to know your contributions, and today to give you the great bouquet of this occasion where your friends, family, colleagues can say thank you on behalf of the patients, the community, uh, internal medicine, and all the great organizations and great causes that you have championed. So, Professor Friedman, to Dr. Friedman, uh, to the grandchildren, uh, we uh, thank you for sharing him with us. And, Dr. Friedman, uh, we uh, just love, respect, honor, cherish everything you have done here at this great institution for our patients, our community, and we're all the better for it. Thank you very much. Dean Lucchesi. So good afternoon. So I'm going to up one on the president. On, uh, in October of 1985, I was a medicine intern in the Department of Internal Medicine here at SUNY Downstate. 
I was assigned to nursing station A51 at Kings County Hospital. That's October. I started my residency in July. So I show up at work, and there's one of our chief residents who is a third year resident is waiting for us. And they said, you're attending this month as Dr. Eli Friedman. Okay, that sounds good. He said, Dr. Friedman's a special person. <laughs> Dr. Friedman is extremely punctual, so don't come late. Dr. Friedman is extremely smart, so don't leave here one day without asking him a question if you have any issues at all. And Dr. Friedman is scary. <laughs> But you'll soon find out he's a very, very, very good man. So I would come in, and, and uh, normally you got in as an intern about 8 o'clock in the morning, and your attending rounds were at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I was, uh, I was no fool. I got in at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and I went over all of my patients. Dr. Friedman would take the elevator. He'd come up to the fifth floor. The elevator door would open, you'd hear that elevator door opening, and he would stand looking up at the clock. And at exactly 9.59, he would start his slow, methodical walk into the doctor's room. He would enter that room at exactly 10 a.m., and he would close that door behind him without looking to see who was coming in. If you weren't in that room, you missed attending rounds on that day. And that's just the way it was. You would make presentations to Dr. Friedman, the intern that was on. And everybody would be in the room, and I'm studying my patients that I admitted the day before in case he asked me any questions. They would go through the presentation, go into the chief complaint and the history of the present illness, and go through the vital signs and the physical exam. And then they would say what the blood work was that they did. He would say, stop to the intern who was presenting, he'd point to somebody in the corner of the room and he'd say, repeat the vital signs. We were all scared <laughs> to death. Well, I have to tell you my fear, um, at the beginning of the month, it wasn't a week that, that I realized that I was in a very, very special place. It still remains probably my favorite month in my entire medicine residency. And I learned more in that month than I probably have learned um, in the remainder of my, of my greater than 30-some-odd year career. So, Dr. Freeman, I, I, um, I will be eternally grateful to you for all the people that you have touched and for all those people who've touched people and for all those people who've touched people, dot, dot, dot. So you, uh, you deserve uh, all the accolades you could possibly get, and I want to give you a personal, uh, a personal thanks. Have a great day. One of the closest uh, associates of Dr. Friedman is Dr. Barbara Delano. Uh, I believe they've been together since 1960. Don't, don't say okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. She will make some comments. Thank you. It's a long time. Ago. Eli, everybody. So would the Possibly, with the exception of his daughters and Je Dr. Gerald Thompson, I think I've been associated with Eli the longest, and he is the reason I'm a nephrologist. So I'm going to, you know, I have something for, to you two guys. My first dealing with him was when I was a third year medical student here at Downstate, and I was on the ward at Kings County Hospital, and we had a patient. His name was Alan Morris. I can say it because HIPAA wasn't. Freedom. Pre HIPAA. He was 19 years old and he had severe end stage renal failure. He wasn't my patient, he wasn't even on my team, but I was there that evening. And all of a sudden, the door burst open and this very young, energetic, new assistant professor who had trained at uh, the Brigham and was coming to start a dialysis unit here. And he talked to the patient and his family and they were going to sign consent. So they asked me they needed a witness for consent. So I witnessed it. And because of that, I became interested and I went to see the first few treatments. And they were very different from these machines that he showed you. It was like a big washing machine tank. You put water in, 
the chemist would weigh out the sodium, weigh out the glucose, and Eli taught the nurses, test the white powder, make sure you're putting in the glucose, you know, make sure, you know, you're putting in the sodium. So in any event, I was hooked. And after I graduated and did my residency, I was a fellow. And I have to say that um, that was the beginning. We were kind of intertwined since then. I had the privilege of knowing Barry, his wonderful wife. I had the privilege of knowing the girls growing up. Uh, they knew my children. And I think Sarah, you're still Facebook friends with my daughter, Wendy. And all I can say is, and this is, this is Women's Day, that Eli was wonderful for me as a woman. I had my two children. Um, well, well, no, my daughter was born in medical school, but my son was born when I was a fellow. Very supportive. And Eli, you gave me a career that has been wonderful for me. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Is Miss Winston uh, here yet or not, Miss Winston? Otherwise, we will continue until she comes. Um, we would have Amy Friedman. Amy Friedman is the first daughter of Eli Friedman, and uh, she actually is an alumnus of SUNY Down State. She eventually became professor of surgery and a transplant surgeon. Please welcome to the podium. Say a few words. Thank you, Mauro. Um, the only medical thing that I will say to doc today is that Dr. Lucchese, while you were in rounds with my father, I was in rounds simultaneously as a surgical resident here in the same years. Uh, but, and I am the bridge, I think, between this part of his family and our blood part of the family. But today I'm representing the blood part of his family, my two sisters, Becky and Sarah, my brother-in-law, Chris, my husband, Simon, and five grandchildren. The fifth is on his way from, uh, from JFK, but five out of eight of his grandchildren. And it's not only him. This, anything to be said about my dad must truly include thoughts of my mother as well, who is very, very much a part of all of this. What I'd like you to know is a bit more about Eli the man. He's a son of Brooklyn and very much a child of World War II and the memories and impact of the Holocaust, very colored by, by those themes of right and wrong, of great evil and great good, of courage and heroism and of romance, great romance. And when I say that word, of course, I think of his romance with my mother. To him, family is above everything else. And he has always been very chivalrous and really, he makes me think so much of Don Quixote, man of La Mancha fighting for what is right and singing about it too. I don't know if you've been blessed to hear him singing. He does, he does a very nice job. Hard work has always been of critical importance to him, together with perseverance, the importance of following through. If you say you're going to do something, you must do it. You must honor your word. Loyalty, he is above everything else loyal to those who give to him and have made his life possible. And chief there is downstate because he very much felt that he would never have been able to be a physician if downstate wasn't here. And I think that that is important to understand underneath everything about why he has been so incredibly loyal to downstate and to Brooklyn for all of these years, allegiance, and sacrifice are critical words to him as well. He has really danced with stars and with highly placed politicians around the world, 
but he has always, always been humble. Humility is incredibly important to him, as well as his respect for authority and a good sense of humor. He may not remember Officer Good, my two sisters will, when we were on a family trip out west and, well, maybe Dad was driving just a little too fast and he did get pulled over and got given a speeding ticket and he was very respectful. He knew that he had earned that speeding ticket but Dad has always been able to see, see the human inside of the person who is performing their function and to draw that person out to revel, revel in the humanity. So Officer Good posed happily for a picture with us that became a part of the family album of that trip. Yep. Dad has always focused on education as being critically important. And also, you may not know this about him, but he is a secret benefactor. He has put many, many more people than the, his three daughters through college education. And he never, together with my mother, and they never wanted credit for it. They just wanted to do good. And if you know the, the fabulous Charles Dickens story, Great Expectations, and how Pip was incredibly changed by the fact that there was a secret benefactor who changed his life. I think Dad has always enjoyed being that to many people who, whose lives have been deeply changed. He's always able to find the fun and magic in life. And most of all, as I've said, draw out the humanity, see the human being in those around him. He's a lifelong learner and really has always had this great curiosity um, and is respectful of people learning new skills. I remember, and he won't remember this, but about 15 years ago, he and I were in, I think it was a supermarket, and there was a woman who at the time sure seemed on the older side to me, now I think she might not have seemed quite so old, but she was clearly struggling a bit with the electronic cash register that she was trying to make function. And I was feeling quite impatient, and I'm sure that that was evident. And Dad just turned to me and said, you know, be patient with her. She's learning something new in life. Give her a chance. And that really impacted me, and I think it's that appreciation of the human side of things and being able to give people a chance, nurture them, be humble as you're helping them and facilitating them to do that, that has been one of the greatest lessons for me. I will also say that wealth and class, though he danced with all of these highfalutin people, they never impacted him more than any other human being on the street or in his clinic that he interacted with. And as many of you know, he has had some pretty celebrity type patients over the years. And he made them come all and wait in his clinic together with the other patients here at Downstate to see him. And they did so happily because he made them understand that that's the way it is. He treats everyone the same. So if I've tried to share with you some of the great epic themes of his life thus far, I also want you to know how much he has always been a romantic. And I will therefore close my words by just having us symbolically raise a toast to my dad and say, Dad, here's looking at you, kid. Thank you, Amy. And uh, is Linda here? Yes. Okay. Linda Cohen is one of the uh, nurses, the nurse practitioners who has worked with uh, Dr. Friedman for a long time and would like to make some comments. Thank you. I'm just going to read some of this to get through it. So Dr. Friedman, Friedman family, and guests. I have had the unique and privileged opportunity to work very closely with Dr. Friedman since the early 80s. It's been nothing short of extraordinary. As you know, the person-centered or the patient-centered movement began almost 20 years ago. 
Efforts contributing to this movement place great importance on the patient visit and interaction with the provider and the staff. This includes how well clinicians communicate and engage with their patients, whether they involve their patients in decision making, and how they build a strong clinical partnership. For those of you who have been fortunate to be on patient rounds or be in the clinic setting with him, you've witnessed the epitome of person-centered care or patient-centered care way, way before it became a popular term. Dr. Friedman took into account the quote-unquote whole patient before the term whole was an everyday concept. Some examples illustrate this. When patients came in for consultations, he made sure he knew who they were and if they were knowledgeable about their illness. It was really fascinating to see how the patients and their families evolved from being a passive recipient in their care to becoming an active and informed partner. During clinic visits, after he was finished with the exam and patient counseling, he would move his chair right up to the family member, staying at eye level, and ask, how are you doing? Always. On one occasion, a longtime patient with multiple disabilities was having some difficulty obtaining a home mortgage from the bank. With her permission, Dr. Friedman called the bank to advocate on her behalf, and yes, she obtained the mortgage. Together with his late wife, Barry, Dr. Friedman's commitment and enthusiasm to start and continue our successful kidney club enabled patients and their families to come together to learn about their illness and to gain support from one another. This has been going on for over 25 years here. For me, Dr. Friedman has been very influential in my career growth. After working with him for only a couple of months, he told me I would be going to St. Louis to present at a conference. I panicked. I said, I never did that before. He said, don't worry, you will be ready. He was so generous with his time, weekends, all afternoon, to get me ready. I was ready, and I will always be grateful for your confidence and support. So Dr. Friedman, you have impacted and inspired so many lives, our patients, our staff, our students, I count myself in that group as well. Congratulations on your retirement. Just a comment for Dr. Lucchese. I'm surprised you didn't become a nephrologist. <laughs> I'm really surprised because Dr. Delano couldn't, couldn't uh, survive, and I couldn't survive. <laughs> so I'm surprised that you were able to escape. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to wear a different hat. I'm the division chief, uh, division of nephrology. Uh, Dr. Friedman was division chief from 1963 to 2008. Um, I was minding my business in transplant, and one day he came to my office and said, Moro, I think you're ready to be chief. I said, what is that? <laughs> and then that was it. Uh, he insisted I become chief, and then um, we had done some great work together, published a lot together, and I was very, very grateful for that. Dr. Burke is in the audience. Could you stand and be recognized, Dr. Burke? <clears throat> he was the chair at the time. <laughs> he was the chair of medicine at the time. So Dr. Friedman took me to Dr. Burke's office and said, Dr. Burke, I think this gentleman is ready to be chief. And I said, OK, hey, make me chief. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't hurt. <laughs> it doesn't hurt. But uh, it's, it's truly remarkable what uh, this man has done to all of us. And so from the division perspective, I'm going to give you what we understand of Friedman. OK, <clears throat> so it's in different segments. So this segment has already been digested by Amy. Uh, thank you very much for bringing it up. But I want to show some additional uh, things that we know about your dad. This is 1957. Newly married. He had finished medical school. And he was on his way to Boston. So this, this, this picture is actually taken in Boston when he arrived for his residency training. This is Barry Mildred. That is uh, his uh, beloved wife uh, who shared a wonderful life with uh, Dr. Friedman. Um, amazing. Uh, she actually was instrumental with Dr. Friedman in the creation of the Association of the uh, Kidney Patients, AAKP. And it's now a national organization. It's surviving a, over 100,000 members of that uh, association. 
like Amy said, he's a family man. He doesn't do anything without his family. It's amazing. They travel together, like en masse. Wait, is the officer good there? <laughs> they travel together en masse, and they enjoy life. Three daughters, right? Amy, uh, Becky, and Sarah. And they've already been introduced, and they're all in their you know, old, own worlds. Um, Amy being transplant surgeon, uh, Becky being the senior vice president for the United Jewish Federation, it's a big organization, and Becky is an oncologist and a professor of medicine. It's amazing. Eight grandkids, always with them. <laughs> this man doesn't fear anything. <laughs> you know, he's. He's a member of the National Geographic Explorer Club. He loved photography. If there's a camera, that is version 2.0, the last one, he has it. <laughs> he has all the versions of Nikon and Canon, just name it, and he will take the best pictures. Look at him. There's about a million Willoughby's here, and he's, he wants to show that he's there, and we can see that he's there. And then, <laughs> This is in Tanzania with the Maasai, the Maasai tribe. As a matter of fact, in 2000, 2000, uh, no, 1998, he brought the king of Maasai to Downstate to give grand rounds. Do you remember that? The guy came in the same dress from Tanzania. And then we had a nice session with him. Of course, there was translation, and, but we had a nice uh, uh, taste of the culture of the Maasai people. Service and pioneer spirit was amazing. It's unbelievable, all the stuff that has been said already, but in pictures. This is when he returned from the CDC. So from, the, uh, from Harvard, he went to the CDC to become the epidemic intelligence officer for CDC for about two years, and then he came to Downstate after that. So this was his uh, first interaction with our then first chair of medicine, Dr. Perrin Long. They were planning what to do next. And what came next was amazing, it was amazing. Here you see Dr. Thompson, the first fellow ever of nephrology, and the first black or African-American fellow of nephrology. The first person of color to be a nephrologist is Dr. Gerald Thompson, and he rose to become the chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the president of the American College of Physicians. This is 19, around 1963. This was the construction of the first federally funded dialysis unit at Kings County Hospital. He was the first to be awarded a federal grant to make sure that that program happens. And that's part of the construction at the county. And later on, we also got our own dialysis unit uh, at Parkside. But for those in the hospital business, did you know that dialysis was actually in the emergency room? The emergency department, as we know it, is actually a dialysis unit. That's it. That was the dialysis unit. <laughs> and then, it, then we, you know, he was instrumental in making sure that we move out and then provide a better space for the patients to uh, get dialysis. And uh, I believe uh, we have a lot of people here uh, represented as well from the hospital. So this di parks are dialysis. He was president of two national societies and two international societies. It's amazing. He trained the first black or African-American fellow and the first woman fellow in nephrology. He recruited the first African-American transplant surgeon, and I'm gonna show you some pictures to that. And he's credited for treating the first black patient, the first Hispanic patient, the first Jewish patient. He's the first to do all those treatments because of the, by virtue of the location of our hospital. This is uh, Dr. Thompson. Have you arrived or not yet? Not yet. But this is Dr. Thompson in 1995. He was uh, testifying uh, on behalf of the American College of Physicians to the House and Ways, Ways Committee uh, in Washington, D.C. Academic life was just fulfilling, just unbelievable. If you Google Dr. Friedman, you'll find more than 700 publications. More than 700 publications. This, this was done a while ago. 12 books. He has lectured in every single niche of the world, not the United States, of the world. And we have pictures to prove that, but it's just that it's too much to show. One of his heroes 
is William Kolf. This is the man who invented dialysis. He invented the procedure in Camden, uh, Holland, Netherlands. But because of the war, the Second World War, he couldn't make it move. So he came to the United States first at Mount Sinai. He was rejected. Then he went to uh, the Brigham. That was exactly the time that Dr. Friedman also went to Brigham for his residency. And so it was William Kolf, the people who accepted the procedure at the Brigham, and Friedman. That made nephrology. So in reality, he's third in the series. And in the United States, he's number one in the series to perform dialysis. That is why when we talk of Eli Friedman, we're all very sentimental because of the history, where he started from, and how he impacted the field from the beginning. This is the second man that he's fan of. This is the man who made chronic dialysis possible. Of course, William Kauf invented the procedure, but they didn't know how to make it chronic. They could treat the patient in acute kidney injury, but they didn't understand how to repetitively, uh, repetitively provide the dialysis beyond one or two sessions because there was no vascular access. He's the guy who came up with ideas for long-term vascular access placement and making sure that the patient can survive long-term. He is most credited because of the portable dialysis machine, also called the artificial kidney or suitcase kidney. Uh, and he has already explained why he had this idea. Because there were so many people who could be treated, who wanted to travel and couldn't travel, um, or who wanted the convenience of doing the dialysis at home and who couldn't do it. And that was the idea that drove him to this invention. And uh, all over the world. As a matter of fact, I speak a lot. And any time I get to a hospital to speak, the first thing they ask me, how is Eli Friedman? And then I say, oh, he's fine, you know. And they go, wow, he's alive. I say, yeah, of course he's alive. <laughs> At downstairs, we keep them alive. <laughs> All right? One of his first patients. All right? And then um, this is uh, Dr. Murray. This is the man who did the first kidney transplant in 1954 at the Brigham. They did it, but they didn't know how to make the kidney work long term. And Dr. Friedman was the first person to introduce Imran to treatment of transplantation. That made it possible for us to give long term treatment for kidney transplantation. So here, uh, in 1972, he was instrumental in bringing uh, Dr. Kunz. For those of you who don't know the picture, this is Dr. Kunz. If you go to the transplant floor, we see, you know, nice plaque. Uh, he was also the first black transplant surgeon uh, in the West Coast, and Dr. Friedman was the instrumental in bringing him to Downstate. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the, the man who won the Nobel Prize at the time for immunology. Uh, so when Dr. Coons came, they had a celebration for him for uh, coming to start the transplant program at Downstate. And that is uh, Medawai in Dr. Friedman's office. These are the big names in nephrology. Um, this is the man who invented, well, who described clinical nephrology. This is the man who described uh, home dialysis. And this is the inventor of the dialysis. And then this is Eli Friedman in the middle. He was always with anyone who is pioneer. If you are a pioneer and you don't know Friedman, then you, don't, you are not really a pioneer. That was his type. If you are a pioneer in anything, he has to know you and you have to, he has to do something with you. And you have to come to downstate, it's a criteria. You have to come to downstate. So in one of the meetings, he was able to get all the various presidents of societies, the president of ASN, National Kidney Foundation, American Society for Artificial Internal Organs. He got everybody together, and he himself was president of those societies together to take this picture. It's remarkable. And then sometime in 2002, 2003, we're talking in his office, he said, Moro, I'm going to bring the great guys to dance it. He called it the, the greats. I said, what is that? He said, I'm going to bring every single human being who has ever been a personality in nephrology, I'm going to bring you to Downstate for a day. I said, whoa, can you do that? He said, yeah, I can do that. So he pulled this off. This is the man who did the first kidney transplant, clinical nephrology. Um, there is the PD guy who invented PD, the Stasel, who invented liver transplantation. And uh, of course, you all have now, now familiar with this face, the inventor of dialysis. And our own Dr. Burke and Dr. Avram, who also started dialysis for the patients on diabetes and Dr. Delano, who started our first PD program at Downstate. Dr. Moncrief, yes, PD, personal analysis. These are the first in nephrology. He brought all of them to Downstate. So we had a great day. Um, Dr. Taylor is here. Dr. Ian Taylor, if he's here, he will remember this day very well. Dr. LaRosa remembers this day very well as well. 
and uh, to our president, Dr. Dibeki. Dr. Dibeki was the president of the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs, for which Dr. Friedman was the president. And this is the picture of them together. And this is Dr. Murray, the uh, person who did the first uh, renal transplant in twins. He loved patients, as you have already heard. But there were three special situations I want to describe. The first special situation is Dr. Andrew Landane. This man in 1968 finished college like top grades, AAA, like A plus guy, but had kidney failure and wanted to do medicine. He tried very hard, nobody would take him. Somebody said, go to Brooklyn, there's some crazy guy there, maybe he can do something for you. He comes and then Dr. Friedman arranges the interview with the College of Medicine and then they call him to the College of Medicine and say, look, this guy is really good, but I don't think he, we don't think he's gonna live. And Dr. Friedman said, I guarantee it. Those are his words. And Andrew Lundin was on dialysis twice a week, went through medical school, became assistant professor at Downsit, rose to become ch chief of the division of nephrology at Kings County Hospital, and became the president of the American Association of Kidney Patients. <clears throat> Another one from Kenya in the late 1970s, finished Ethiopia. Uh, finished medical school and then developed kidney failure from diabetes, type 1. Then they said, if you don't go to see that crazy guy in Brooklyn, you're going to die. She comes to Brooklyn, goes to Dr. Friedman and says, look, this is my situation. I can't do residency. No, don't worry. We're make, going to make you a resident. He made sure that Dr. Warrikal was a resident in internal medicine at Downstate. She finished medicine. She did a fellowship in nephrology. She became assistant professor, associate professor, and also became director of dialysis at Kings County Hospital. And then his favorite, favorite uh, secretary, uh, you know, Judy, you know, worked with uh, Dr. Friedman for more than 30 years and uh, developed kidney failure. He made sure that she got a kidney transplant. It failed and put her back on dialysis, got another kidney transplant, and she lived with kid kidney failure for more than 28 years before she died. Those were just special examples. And then, you know, patients, you bring patients together. Uh, this is the formation of the American Association of Kidney Patients at Downstate. Can you imagine forming an, an association at Downstate that becomes a national phenomenon? If you, this is an organization where sometimes you go to the meetings and you can have 5,000 people in the meeting. Just like the patients, nurses, doctors come to talk about patient issues. All from Downstate because of Eli Friedman. One of the stories that uh, is very interesting about uh, his whole life was this interaction with MGR, M.G. Ramachandran. He was the first prime minister of the state of Tamil Nadu in India. Um, Ramachandran was an actor, he was a writer, screen player, he was everything. He was like the Denzel Washington of the United States in India. Everybody knew the name. Then he developed kidney failure in 1978. Somebody said, you have to come to Downstate if you want to live. So he came. This was the president, Dr. Shell, welcoming him. And then, uh, of course, the kidney transplant happened very nicely. He recovered fully. Then there was a state dinner on behalf of Dr. Friedman. The entire state of Tamil Nadu <laughs> said thank you to Eli Friedman. It's amazing. And then they honored him with a Doctor of Science degree before he left uh, on that occasion. Many, many stories, including his uh, being honored as, as the, at the Royal College of Physicians uh, as FRCP. When it comes to education, I have never really encountered somebody who can teach like Eli Friedman. It's amazing what he does with, with students and residents and fellows, even junior faculty members, senior faculty members. He would intellectually stimulate you, whether you like it or not. And it could be good or bad, but he would get the good out of it. See here, pictures of Eli Friedman teaching with our fellows in his office for morning report. Up until four or five years ago, he did morning report three times a week, like diligently. He never missed a single one of them. He probed and probed and probed. It's amazing. He will probe you to twist your mind. In other words, you say it is green, and he will twist you and say it's red, and oh, okay. Maybe I can change the, uh, the, the frequency of the wavelength and actually get a green out of the red. 
He will ask you, why is diabetes a bad thing? Maybe we're evolving as a species. Why don't you think about that for a minute? If everybody's getting diabetic, if it was 1%, it's now 15%, maybe the species is evolving. Maybe diabetes is good for you. Maybe you don't know, but you have to find out. Maybe obesity is good for you because everybody's living longer and everybody's getting fat. Maybe the species is getting fatter because we're just evolving. Why don't we think about that instead of thinking about the bad part? Maybe if we think about the good part, we might get something out of it. He says, it's a walrus, a walrus. You know, walruses are like fat animals, but they can swim, though, but they are very fat. He will ask, is a walrus a walrus, or is it a fat walrus? Those are the questions he will ask. And he will say, by the time you, your, your children will finish medical school or whatever, uh, there will be, no, be a pill, and everybody will have no kidney problems. He will just stimulate everyone to just think differently, and for that reason, it's just amazing. He made my career, he made everybody's career. It's just unbelievable. So we want to say, on behalf of Renal Division and Department of Medicine, we want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Friedman, for placing our institution uh, on the national and international stage. We want to thank you for serving our institution with distinction. And on this day, we pay tribute to you, and we want to wish you well in your retirement. But we know that this retirement is a transition from being distinguished professor of medicine to distinguished professor emeritus. Sorry, distinguished professor to distinguished teaching professor emeritus. So we hope to see more of you, and we wish you well. <clears throat> I will now call on the President and Dean Lucchese to present to him the honor of Master of Medicine. We wanted to choose a title that befits him, and uh, our community came up with this title. So Dr. Thompson's Dr. Friedman, please Dr. come forward. Dr. Thompson's here. Have Dr. Thompson. Dr. Come Thompson. Forward. Jerry. What are you? Please. Come forward. Please come forward. <laughs> Mr. President, Dean, Chairman, faculty in the medical school in our division, friends. To have evolved as Downstate grew and became the strengthened representative of the best in medicine in Brooklyn and in New York was a honor that I never dreamed of having. And hearing Dr. Salafu go through what I lived and enjoyed was remarkable, stimulating, and exhilarating to me. And I thank all of the people, including that woman who found it comfortable in medicine to be in nephrology and made our division an exemplary example of how far women could go and what they might have as their field of learning, teaching, and accomplishment. And that's Barbara Augustine Delano, who I am thankful to know. I, I won't go over all that you've heard again, and so you can relax. I'm not going to go through the exceptional history of being a member of the Brooklyn arm of academic medicine that was learning how to flourish in Brooklyn and changing the field of nephrology. I will tell all of you who are associated with Downstate that one of our truly great accomplishments was to become the first federally funded dialysis unit in the United States. And we, we grew and we knew how to behave and what to teach and to celebrate our accomplishments. And it was my joy to be here watching what happened as it did. And I thank the presidents, the deans, 
the chairpersons who not only tolerated me for my uh, sometimes uh, inappropriate behaviors, but who also made it possible for me to practice medicine, enjoy medicine, and not be guilty feeling for expressing opinions that were at variance with the majority or with the uh, culture of medicine as it was being taught. I think that you received a fair perspective and picture of downstate as we evolved. And I will treasure to my last conscious day, having been here to watch, to participate, observe, and now to celebrate having been here and enjoying the benefits to the practitioner of trying to share the latest news, the best accomplishments, and the exhilaration of a future that's being visualized and not only that, realized. We'll hear more of this, all of us, as we go on for as long as we can be attached to a place like Downstate Medical Center. And I am thankful to the officials, to the house staff, to the nursing staff, to the associated professionals with uh, the skills that will facilitate medicine functioning to bring the kinds of changes that we want to bring to our patients as realities. Thank you. Thank you for tolerating me in my sometimes offbeat ideas and for allowing me to have the joy of realizing what medicine can do, not only for the patients that it benefits, but for the practitioner who participates and enjoys seeing those who had no hope, those who were obviously going to die, not die, and live on for as long as 40 years of dialysis. It's a wonderful experience, and I thank Downstate for allowing me to have it. Thank you very much. This is phenomenal. We are right on time. Nice. Okay, so this concludes the session. So we have to thank all the organizers. Um, Joshila, where are you? The Joshila is the, uh, she was heard in the committee for this uh, event. So we'd like to thank Joshila and all the committee members who planned this. So thank you very much. <laughs> so the general session is now over. We, so for those of you who have RSVPs, we're going to move to the FAB and then uh, some additional activities will continue from there, from 5.15 to uh, 8 o'clock. So thank you very much for coming, uh, and uh, have a good day. Mm -hmm.